What's up guys and welcome back to the channel where we learn, do, and talk about photography until we're sick of it. Uh, video cameras, I guess, today. And I've got a very cool camera to show you with top line video specs that I got for $1,900 and I didn't even know this camera existed. So we'll talk about why I think that is, uh, what the cameras are that I was considering to fulfill the purpose that this camera serves and why I landed on this as a great first cinema camera option that uh, if you're in my situation, you might not even know about. First, let me say a big thank you to everyone who helped push me over the thousand subscriber threshold last month. Uh, this is the longest break I've ever taken between YouTube videos, and that's a partly to take a breather and kind of appreciate that little accomplishment, partly because of some time and money that I was investing into my video production over the last month, including acquiring and learning this camera, and partly because getting my channel monetized kind of takes the pressure off of uh, feeling like I need to check in here even if I don't necessarily have something to say. And so, you know, I, I kind of feel like I can focus on making videos when I have something valuable to say or, or to contribute to the conversation. And I think this video can really help someone out who might be in the situation I was in a month ago looking to uh, elevate the quality of my video productions. So my previous video kit was centered around the Canon R7. I have a lot of content about that if you want to check it out, and it's recording me now. Uh, and my stills camera, which I could sometimes use as a, a supplemental angle, the EOS R. Uh, and those two cameras obviously sh uh, shot through good glass. They, they can make a much better image than a cell phone. But increasingly, I was getting work from clients who, like, as I scrolled through their uh, websites and their past projects, uh, they'd hired out for, I could see that the quality of the video I was getting out of my kit uh, didn't quite hold up to the cinema camera footage that they're probably expecting or used to seeing. So I was in the market for a camera with a higher quality video output with the goal of making the highest quality videos that I could get for my clients. To clarify, the main scenario where the mirrorless hybrid Canon cameras I was using fell short of the mark was in the outdoor interview or even some challenging indoor interviews where there was just not enough dynamic range in the cameras to deliver a high quality image. So these two interviews are a good example. This first one doesn't look too bad, but I had to meticulously composite in the sky from another piece of footage because despite underexposing the subject, the sky was completely blown out and cheap looking. And in the second one, the light level rose and I like I was managing two cameras and we were pressed for time and I missed that I needed to make an exposure adjustment and the face, which honestly didn't look great before, uh, now is completely clipped. And even after hours of meticulous color correction, I had to deliver this to the client in sort of a compromised state. However, the new camera I chose crushed this situation, maintaining a nice sky, even though I still shot it with the face overexposed at 50% IRE. The quest for more dynamic range that delivered me to buy this camera started with two hybrid cameras I was seriously considering, and the first is probably the most unusual, and that was the Canon uh, EOS R6 Mark II. So that should give you some idea of the price that I was shopping in. I consider this investment in video quality to be worth probably about $2,500 to my clients, and that's the sticker price of the R6 Mark II. What attracted me to that camera is, first off, I do still primarily consider myself a stills photographer, and I think the R6 Mark II is like an unsung lion in the stills world, and all the stills capability that that camera has packed into it were really appealing, keeping in mind that I was considering this as a replacement to my EOS R. Uh, but the R6 Mark II also does uncropped oversampled 4K60 with very little rolling shutter, so there's like a lot to love there for video work as well. The only problem with this choice, and the reason I call it an unusual choice, is like it still didn't solve my primary problem. It still tops off with the same C-Log3 as my R7. It has very similar dynamic range, and yes, I did test that with an R8 that I rented, but even despite that, I was still considering the R6 Mark II very seriously right up to the second that I decided on this cinema camera, in part because it does also offer external raw recording. So that would complicate the rig, it would add a little to the price tag. I, I think I was tending to think of the R6 Mark II as like a great stills camera that I could work towards building into a great video camera. Uh, but uh, this camera records raw internally without the need to buy, rig up, charge, and carry around an external device that ultimately ended up being very persuasive. However, there is yet another hybrid camera that I have my eye on, and that's the Panasonic S5 2X, 
which does most of what the R6 Mark II can do for a few hundred dollars less. It has a reputable high dynamic range log profile, and if necessary, it can shoot raw directly to an SSD, no need for an external recorder. So when I started considering the S52X, I, I, I became paralyzed. There were too many options now. I, I had to weigh the price, the S52X's drawbacks, like it has a crop in 4K60, it doesn't have really great rolling shutter, I'd have to buy a lens adapter, and now I've got all my gear in two different lens mounts. Uh, uh, but I was really compelled by the thought of having all my video needs met right out of the box, like a pretty good stills camera also, and saving some money to boot. What to do? <laughs> now. I consider myself a pretty informed buyer in the hybrid camera market, and I even maintain a pretty like good general awareness of the availabilities and capabilities of cinema cameras. I know all about the Canon C100s, the three iterations of the C300, the, the two C500s, and of course the C70 and the R5C. Those are cameras that a lot of my friends use and, and love, even though just like they're a hair out of my price range. Uh, but I have never even heard of such a thing as the camera I ultimately ended up buying, which is this guy, the Canon C200. But when reviews of this camera started coming around my YouTube feed as I was researching cameras, I thought, well, I wonder what this is all about. Like, how much does it cost? What does it do? And when I read that it shoots 4K60 RAW internally with face detect autofocus uh, and was going used for under $2,000, like needless to say, this also got thrown into the mix. And I ended up thinking, you know, really, I would be satisfied with any of these cameras. They'd all be a huge upgrade and improvement over my, my current kit. And here's how I broke the tie and settled on this one. First, I went back to that original mandate. So, one, you know, one of these cameras is better for stills, one has a better form factor, one has bad battery life, whatever, right? Uh, what was I going to get out of this camera that I'm not already getting out of my R7? That expensive looking, mouth-watering video footage. That's what I wanted for my clients. And not getting that is probably the only regret that I could possibly have out of this process. So really I thought back to like the first nice landscape lens I ever bought. I didn't care how much it cost. I didn't care how hard it was to get. I was tired of trying to like make do with cheap lenses and trying all kinds of different lenses buying lenses that were like 90% of the quality for 50% of the, of the, of the cost. I wanted a hundred percent of the quality. Uh, like, so this was a long time ago, but you know, the research I did was I went to Flickr. I looked at all my favorite landscape photos and, and checked out the metadata, see, saw which lenses shot, which photos. And ultimately I kept coming back to one lens that I liked over and over again. And you know, I saved up the money. I got that lens. I didn't look back. And that's kind of the process that I took into this camera. I, I was combing through hours of footage on YouTube, camera comparisons, tests, showdowns. I probably spent all my free time for like over a week just looking at camera comparisons. And the footage that I kept coming back to over and over again, test after test, was from this camera, the Canon C200. I never saw one single shot from this camera that didn't look like absolute magic. And so my mind was made up at that point. This is the camera I've been looking for. So let me tell you a little bit about this camera for that viewer who's like me and who's never heard of it. And I'm gonna start with the cons because there's really only one and it's kind of big. So like I said, this camera shoots 4K 60 raw video, which is great. It also shoots uh, 8 -bit, bit C log 3, which you know is okay for like controlled situations. And in between it shoots nothing. There's no 10-bit codec, no C-Log2, like nothing. Even externally, it only shoots 10-bit in C-Log3 and only at 2K, right? So that rules it out for, I think, a lot of professional use cases, for broadcast, for a lot of uh, delivery opportunities. And I, I think that's the reason that, you know, aside from a few raw video enthusiasts, this camera didn't really take off when it was introduced in 2017. And I think that's our major reason that Canon has basically discontinued it, there's no successor model, and that also, uh, to me, is the reason that, for one, I've never heard of it, uh, and for two, all of the information I found in researching it, all the camera reviews, all the comparisons, were from 2017, uh, comparing it to the camera landscape of 2017. So if you can imagine what that was, I think like the hot new camera at the time was the 5D Mark IV DSLR. Uh, and I wanted to put this information out because it's not 2017, and I think there are a lot of reasons this camera is more compelling now than ever. SSDs are cheap. 
They come in terabytes now, not gigabytes. It takes minutes, not hours, to transcode a card full of raw video. And despite ticking all the boxes that most beginner filmmakers are after, the C200, which was introduced at I think around like $7,500, is now cheaper than almost any mirrorless hybrid camera that a beginning filmmaker might be trying to sort of make do with. And that's a claim I intend to put to the test in my next video by comparing the video quality of this camera to similar priced mirrorless uh, still cameras. And if you'd like to have that information at your disposal, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss it. So uh, let's take a second to talk about some of the boxes that it does tick. Pros. The C200 sports a gorgeous Super 35 millimeter sensor, which for us still as converts is basically an APS-C size sensor, something I may have considered a detriment uh, for stills, but have found to be not a problem at all in video. It mounts up to EF lenses, which are plentiful and affordable, like, and while the RF lenses are fantastic, I thought it was great that with the money I saved choosing this camera, I was able to buy like a full complement of capable used EF mount F1.8 primes to flesh out my focal ranges. Form factor. So I won't go into this whole like cinema camera versus portable camera comparison here. I'm probably not the most qualified person to do that. I'll just say that I love that this camera has built-in NDs in two-stop increments, direct XLR microphone inputs with phantom power in addition to 3.5 mil and built-in monora microphone. And I can record four channels of audio and fully configure which input gets recorded to which channel. So uh, that's great. There's, there's a dedicated button on the camera for everything. So while I thought that I was gonna kind of get bogged down switching to this more cumbersome uh, menu system of the cinema operating system, uh, right there, there is a dedicated button for everything and 12 customizable buttons to take you directly into the control you need. So in fact, there's not even like a quick menu in this camera. The whole camera is like one big physical quick menu. Uh, so for example, like uh, circling back to the audio, uh, if I'm doing an interview and monitoring and I need to adjust the volume of the microphone, I just turn this physical volume knob. It's instantaneous. Like on my R7, even though I have a custom menu set up for that, I have to navigate to the page, stop recording, open the menu, uh, go down to the option, right? Uh, open up the recording volume and then like slowly adjust the volume by pushing on the D-pad while my interview subject is doing something awkward, like counting to 10 over and over again. So uh, yeah, the, the menus are more in depth in this camera, but the implementation is actually way faster and more convenient with all of the physical direct control buttons. For capture, the camera records DCI 4K60 to a single CFAS2 card uh, with no additional crops, very good rolling shutter. It records 12-bit RAW up to 30 frames per second, and then it switches to a 10-bit RAW for everything up to 60 FPS. And then it records everything else to dual SD card slots, including simultaneous 1080p um, proxies for your RAW captures. 1080p up to 120 frames per second, and then UHD 4K at all frame rates up to 60 FPS. Um, and that can all be shot in C-Log3, YDR, or a few other profiles, including a direct Rec. 709 rendering in either MP4 or XF AVC envelopes. Uh, lastly, the thing that I think distinguishes the C200 from other 4K cinema cameras at its price point is the touch-to-track autofocus with face detection. Uh, for me, despite being a very early implementation of this now ubiquitous technology, I'd say it's 95% as dependable as my R7. So like clearly Canon wanted to make sure that this tech was uh, ready before launching it in the $7,500 camera. It's much, much, much better than something you might've used on a DSLR from this era. And it also has a fantastic face only mode for those times you don't want the camera to freak out when your subject leaves or re-enters the frame. As a last bonus, uh, as is often said of cinema cameras, when I show up to a job with this as opposed to a stills camera, it instills confidence in my client or colleagues that I'm serious about video and I'm invested in the quality of the project. And that's a nutshell introduction to the Canon C200, why I bought it, why I think it's uh, just the perfect time to be considering this piece of ahead of its time tech, uh, but I suspect you really want to know whether I'm satisfied with my purchase, if it has fulfilled on its promise to elevate the quality of my video productions and uh, how it compares to today's camera offerings. And that is the topic of my next video. So I encourage you to subscribe to see comparison footage, real world examples, and my thoughts after a couple of months using the camera on set, in candids, in controlled and available lighting situations. And I'll see you then. Bye.